Praise the Lord, <clears throat> dear brothers and sisters. I'm so happy that I can, though away from you physically, still be with you in spirit and celebrate this anniversary of ours. It was a wonderful day 38 years ago that God began a work in Bangalore that's gone on and spread around the world. And we praise the Lord for that. It started in a very, very small way with Ian and I seeking God for the power of the Holy Spirit. And then our two families seeking to unite together to form the core of a church to which God has added many, many people through the years. One of the things I prayed to God was that God would help me not to find people who wanted to go to heaven in India. I said, Lord, I'm not interested in finding people who want to go to heaven. India is full of people who want to go to heaven. And I don't want to gather such people. I want to gather people who want to follow Jesus here on this earth and live a life of devotion to him and gratitude for all that he did for us and then go to heaven. And there's a lot of difference between wanting to go, people who want to go to heaven and people who really want to express their gratitude to Christ for what he's done for us. So I hope all of you who are gathered here today don't want to just go to heaven when you die, but have a tremendous sense of gratitude to God for what Jesus did for you on the cross, for Jesus suffering hell for you on the cross for three hours so that you might never go there. I'll never forget it when God revealed that to me, that Jesus went to the cross, accepted it, those three hours of hell on the cross, because there was no other way to save me. Never forget it, my brothers and sisters. In all eternity, we'll be singing the glory of the Lord who died for us on the cross. And I never want to forget it. Every time I sing about Jesus dying for me, I want it to be as though it's the first time I'm hearing it. I want my heart to be moved that someone was willing to give his life to save me from eternal damnation. And that's the thing that makes me worship him and love him with all my heart and live for him. Nothing I do will ever be enough for what he did for me. Don't ever think you can sacrifice more than what he did for you. Some Christians think of the sacrifices they have made for Christ. It's a lot of rubbish. In the light of the sun, the stars disappear. And in the light of Calvary's cross, everything that you call a sacrifice will disappear into darkness. If you can see the sacrifices you have made in your life, it's because you haven't seen the cross. So I want to share something with you today from Jeremiah and chapter 6, first of all. You know, Jeremiah was the prophet who preached for about 40 years to try and save the Israelites from going to Babylon. We're living in a time today when God's people are moving towards Babylonian Christianity, most of them are in there and we have to save them by pulling them out. And Jeremiah's message is a great message to save people from going to spiritual Babylon today. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you shall find rest for your souls. He says, ask for the ancient paths, the paths that the apostles proclaimed and which they walked in in those early days, filled with the spirit, choosing the way of the cross, when you come to the crossroads, choose that ancient way, the way that Jesus opened up 
through the veil by denying his own will and living to please only the Father. That is the way. That's the way the apostles walked, never seeking their own gain or their own interests or their own will in anything. That's the way to build the church. That's what we have proclaimed in CFC all these 38 years, not just the forgiveness of sins, but that ancient way. And those who have chosen that way, it says here, have found rest in their souls. A rest means a freedom from tension in their inner life, freedom from anxiety and fear, freedom from tension in their homes, freedom from conflict in the church when they've cho chosen the ancient way. And there are many forces in our day that are seeking to divert us from that. One way they'll seek to divert you is by telling you, oh, this is a gospel of works. We have to deny ourselves, deny ourselves, deny ourselves. It really, salvation is by grace. We can never do a single work to earn heaven. We can never do any work. A million works will not get our sins forgiven or earn us heaven or give us the Holy Spirit. We can earn nothing. Everything is a free gift of God. But it's not automatic. God doesn't make us like robots where he automatically blesses us irrespective of how we live. The Bible says we reap what we sow. We must never forget that. In our day when people are preaching that obedience to God is a false gospel, let me read to you Galatians 6. How do you get eternal life? Galatians 6, 8 says, The one who sows to his own flesh, and he's writing to brethren, Galatians 6, 1, brethren, believers, if you sow to your flesh, you will reap corruption. Believers will reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit, you'll reap eternal life. Eternal life is the life of God. And we have to do a sowing to the Spirit to partake more and more of that. So in our church, we don't just speak of receiving eternal life when we are born again. We also preach what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. And 12, take hold of eternal life, lay hold of eternal life. And that's what we proclaim. Those are the ancient parts. That's the way that Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. If anyone will come after me, anyone, anyone, anywhere, at any time in history, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is the what we have proclaimed, my brothers and sisters in CFC, all these 38 years, and we'll never stop proclaiming it till Christ comes again. Daily taking up the cross. And if people call that a gospel of works, let them accuse Jesus of preaching a gospel of works. It's not us. Let them accuse Jesus of preaching that we have to deny ourselves every day and follow him. Let them accuse the apostle Paul of preaching a gospel of works when he says, that we have to sow to the Spirit, as we read in Galatians, to reap eternal life. But we're not disturbed by all these charges that other people make. Throughout history, people have accused the true servants of God as being heretics and false preachers and preaching legalism, etc. But we're not disturbed. These are all ways in which the devil seeks to frighten us and threaten us and make us miss the ancient parts. And I believe God has also placed the church later on in Jeremiah chapter 6. He says something which I believe applies to the church today. Jeremiah in chapter 6, we read verse 16, where we are told to ask for the ancient parts and can find rest for our souls. It goes on to say in verse 27, I have made you an assayer, Jeremiah 6, 27, and a tester among my people, that you may know an assay their way. The Lord places the true church of Christ like one who evaluates and assesses an assessor of other Christians. The Lord is the final assessor, but the way we live and what we proclaim is going to expose the hollowness and the shallowness 
of Christendom around us. And that is going to be like an assessment of their ways. We don't pass judgment on anyone. No, that's not our calling. God is the judge of all. But our life must so shine that the darkness is exposed. And that makes people uncomfortable when the darkness is exposed. And so we must not hesitate to stand true to what God has called us to from the beginning. And let me show, share with you a few things that I once shared with people concerning what the full purpose of God for our lives as individuals and as Christians is supposed to be. If you're a true disciple of Jesus, I want to say seven things which must characterize our life. Every individual in CFC, everyone who's listening to me, here are seven things I would urge you to bear in mind. First of all, be a worshiper of God in spirit and truth. John 4, 24, Jesus told the Samaritan woman, the time has come when people must worship in the spirit. God is seeking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The Father seeks for such. What is the desire in your heart when you see your heavenly Father is looking on earth for those who will worship him in spirit and truth? And to worship him in spirit and truth means that we have surrendered our entire life. It's not just words. It's not praise or thanksgiving, which is what we do on Sunday mornings. It's more than that. It's a surrender of our whole life. It's falling down before him and saying, Lord, I desire nothing on earth but you, Lord Jesus. I desire no one on earth but you. And when I get to heaven, I want you. I don't want the golden streets or the mansions. I want you. This is a worshiper who is taken up with the Lord Jesus, who's got to come to a bridal relationship with Christ as his or her bridegroom. Preserve this, brothers and sisters. Don't be occupied like we read Martha was in Luke 10, 38 to 42. Working, 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 working. Working is necessary. But we are to be worshippers first. Matthew 4.10 says, You must worship the Lord and then serve Him. That's the number one thing. I am a worshipper. You see me traveling here, there, preaching and uh, uh, serving the Lord and writing books and trying to spread the gospel. But I'm not a server first. I'm not a servant first. I'm a worshipper. The primary thing in my life is Jesus Christ not my ministry. It's Jesus, my bridegroom. I worship him. I love him because he gave himself for me. And it doesn't matter to me if I can't serve him. I shall always be a worshiper. And when I get into eternity, I shall just continue what I'm doing here. There'll be no preaching there. There'll be no praying there. There'll be no witnessing. There'll be no writing books or internet or any such thing. There will be worshiping. And that's what I've already started doing. I'll just continue doing it for eternity. I want to encourage all of you to do that. And then secondly, Live the new covenant message of victory over sin, the world, and the devil, and proclaim it to others. We must live this life. Once we have decided to be worshippers, then we must seek the power of the Holy Spirit to live this new covenant life where God's laws are written in our mind and our heart by Him, where God works in us through the Holy Spirit to desire and gives us the ability to do his will and we work out our salvation with fear and trembling Philippians 2 12 and 13 and thus live a new covenant life of overcoming sin of being free from anger and free from lusting with our eyes and free from telling lies and free from loving money free from anxiety and fear and wholeheartedly living for Jesus Christ this is my passion and I will never lose it till Christ comes again and I hope that'll be your passion too and proclaim it. Proclaim up to the measure in which you have lived it. You can't proclaim as much as an older brother can who has walked with God much more, but a second standard student can teach second standard stuff, and a first standard student can teach first standard stuff, a 10 standard student can teach 10 standard stuff. Each of us are at different levels. Live and proclaim the new covenant message. And thirdly, be totally free from legalism and the desire to control others. Discipline is a good thing. For example, to get up in the morning and to read the Bible at a certain time is a very good habit. But don't make that a law for others. Maybe you have some other good habits like praying at certain times or fasting. Good, 
That's discipline. Very necessary for a Christian. But when you make it a law for others, it becomes legalism. I personally believe that we should not wear jewelry. But I don't make it a law for others. It's my personal conviction, my wife's conviction from God's word. But when you make it a law for others, it becomes legalism. We teach others to be free from sin. Sin is disobedience to God's revealed will. And remember this, God's revealed will. There could be things that a person still doesn't know are God's will. And so when they do it, they're not disobeying. They're disobeying if they know it and then disobey. To him who knows the right thing to do. James 4.17, the last verse there. To, the, to him who knows what is the right thing to do and does not do it, that is sin. But what if you don't know what is the right thing to do? It's not yet sin for you. Maybe one day it will become. So certain things are sin for me because I've got light on it through 54 years of knowing the Lord. So don't judge others because some of the things you see clearly, they may not see clearly. Be merciful. Don't try to control others because that is what the devil does. The devil demons possess people. The Holy Spirit only guides. So be totally free from legalism. Discipline yourself, but don't force others to hold your view on all these things. And don't try to control them. Number four, be independent financially, but serve God first of all. God and money are opposites, like oil and water. You can't mix the two. And we need money to live on this earth. We don't want to be beggars dependent on others. We, don't, we need to save money so that if there's a future need, we don't go begging from the brothers and sisters in the church, but we are wisely saved for the future. You need to save for your children. That's right. 2 Corinthians 12, 14 says that. Be independent financially. Ask God, if you ha don't have a job enough to earn your living, ask God to give you one. That's like an unmarried person looking for a marriage partner. Perfectly right. But if you're earning more than enough for your needs, then to go looking for more and more money is like a married person looking for another woman. That's wrong. An unmarried man looking for a bride is perfectly okay. And a person who's not earning enough for his needs looking for more money or a better job or another job is perfectly okay. But a person who's earning more than enough for his needs and still looking for more and more money is like a married person, a married man looking, looking at other women. That's 100% wrong. So be satisfied with what God's given you and don't be covetous, but be independent financially, but make money your servant. In other words, the service for God is first. Your job is not first. Your job is a means of earning a living. But put God first. Service for God first. God first, your family second, and the church ministry third. Don't put your ministry above your family. Then you will lose your family. Number five. Build a godly family at home and raise godly children. Really, you need God's help in this evil age to do that. Seek with all your heart and say, Lord, I want my home to be like a light for you. From earliest age, I want to teach my children God's ways. I want to teach them the Bible. I want to teach them God's principles. These are the things CFC has stood for all these years, and we will never change. We want to be examples in the way we have raised our children for God. And I want to encourage all of you, my brothers and sisters, to be that exemplary in the way and where you have failed, in the way you brought up your children. The way if you have failed, go and see God, husband and wife, kneel down before him and say, Lord, I want to repent of my mistakes. I want you to bring my children back into the ways of the Lord. I want them to be wholehearted for you. Pray fast and see God. There's nothing impossible with him. And then number six, ask God to help you to share God's word, even if for a few minutes, perhaps. The Bible says every brother and sister can prophesy. The Holy Spirit's been poured out upon all people to prophesy. Seek for the gift of prophecy. That's what I'm trying to say. Number six, Acts 2, 17 says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, earnestly desire pro to prophesy. Later on in the chapter, it says, you can all prophesy. And prophesy means, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, to speak to people to encourage them, to comfort them, to challenge them, to build them up. And start with your children. And you young brothers, start with those younger to you. If you're 18 years old, you can talk to a 10-year-old. Prophesy to a 10-year-old. Say something that will encourage them. 
challenge them, bless them. There's, there's always somebody younger to you than you in the church. There are people younger than you in your home. Encourage them and say, Lord, will you give me the gift of prophecy to give two minute words of encouragement? And every one of us, you're disobeying scripture. If you disobey God's word, which says 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1, earnestly desire to prophesy. I want all of you, my brothers and sisters, to be unique as a church where everybody is seeking to prophesy at least for one or two minutes. When you speak on the cell phone, share one or two sentences that's blessed, blessed you. I mean, so many people gossip on the cell phone. Why not prophesy? Share a word that encourage, challenge, and build up. When you send an email, why not add one or two sentences at the end to challenge, encourage, build up? You know, it'll make a world of difference. It's so easy for us to do it. Seek God and say, Lord, I want your Holy Spirit to fill me and give me the gift of prophecy that I can share something that will bless others. That way you will fulfill your function as the body in the body of Christ. Every one of you, my brothers and sisters who are born again, have got a function in the body of Christ. And finally, let me say, build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, a new covenant church. You have a very important function in the church. We've always taught that. If you can't do anything else, you can encourage others. You've heard me say this, that even if you're like the little nail at the tip of your finger, you say, well, I'm not even a little finger, I'm just a nail. You know that when you feel scratchy, it is a nail that helps you to scratch. And can you scratch somebody's back? What does that mean? Encourage somebody, you may be a little nail, you're a very useful member in the body. You can encourage people. Take it seriously. And I pray that we will never be a church with just a few brothers who are doing all the work. And that we will never be a church with others volunteering only for tasks like the practical tasks, the earthly tasks of many, many earthly things. I want a church where every one of you will do spiritual things in the body of Christ. And encouraging others, scratching people's back means encourage one another daily. Let me give you a verse that will take you through the rest of your life. Hebrews in chapter 3. We've often quoted it, but I want to quote it again. Hebrews in chapter 3. It says here, verse 13, Encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that no one is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Do you know that you may be a wonderful brother, but you're, you are your brother's keeper. you got to help your brother not to be hardened because there's so much of deceitfulness through sin in the world around. And all you got to do is sometimes say one sentence in a, over on, when you're talking on a cell phone or one sentence in an email to encourage. Just a word of encouragement. What, you know the times when somebody's encouraged you. What a difference it's made your day. What a difference you can make to others if you will just encourage them. So, brothers, as we begin another year as a church, I pray that we will function as members of one body and build a new covenant church like that burning bush which Moses saw, which made him stop and listen, and God spoke to him through it. We want to be a church that proclaims God's word and will make people passing by stop and listen, and God will speak to them. And like it says in 1 Corinthians 14, when we all begin to prophesy, like I have just said, people will come into the church and they will say that the secrets of their heart will be made manifest, like it says in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 24 and 25. And they'll say, God is here. That's my greatest desire. That in our church services, people will go away, not saying we heard a message or we had good singing, but we met with Jesus. Jesus was here. We met with him. Our lives are changed. May God bless us all. I stand with you and pray that God will bless us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for these many years you've preserved us. I pray that you'll preserve us till the day, Lord Jesus, you return from heaven. We want to be faithful until the end with the vision you've given us to lead people into that true Jerusalem to be the bride of Christ. Help every brother and sister here. Let no one be discouraged. Encourage them. Bless every family. And grant that this church will glorify your name and be one that you can point out to Satan 
as one that shines with the light of God, of the glory of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters.